We are at the Henry A. Wallace Country Life Center, which is 50 miles south and west of Des Moines. The Wallace Centers of Iowa consists of two historic locations, both honoring the three generation of Wallaces. So there's the Wallace House in Sherman Hill in Des Moines, and there's this 40-acre farm, the Henry A. Wallace Country Life Center. Henry A. and Henry C. and Uncle Henry were always involved in food. So our work does not revolve around a museum. Our work revolves around communities and pro um, programming in food and civility initiatives. So on the farm we raise fruits and vegetables and we use the produce in our restaurant and we go to farmers markets. Henry A. Wallace is probably the most known of the three generations of Wallaces. He was born on this farm. He went on to become editor of Wallace's Farmer magazine. He was then asked by Franklin Roosevelt to serve as U.S. Secretary of Agriculture, which he did for eight years, from 1933 to 1941. In 1941 to 1945, he was Roosevelt's Vice President, and he was founder of Pioneer Hybrid International, which is now DuPont Pioneer. He was a Progressive Party candidate for the presidency in 1948, and throughout his life he was a scientist and a humanitarian. The Wallaces of Iowa consist of three generations of Wallaces. The patriarch was known as fondly as Uncle Henry, and he uh, worked in Winterset, Iowa, which is about 18 miles east of this farm. And he was the founder of Wallace's Farmer magazine, and he was a um, champion for rural America. And his son, Henry C. Wallace, was um, U.S. Secretary of Agriculture under Woodrow Wilson from 1921 to 1924, so about three years he died in office. And Henry C.'s son was born on this farm in 1888, and I've already told you about Henry A. Wallace. But um, this farm is significant because he lived here until he was four years old, so we get to claim him. But all three generations were concerned about rural prosperity and how they could help people better understand farming and how they felt it was important that people were close to the soil. Henry A. Wallace uh, was taking a walk in Waterworks Park in Des Moines and a Western Union person came up to him with a telegram and it was from Franklin Roosevelt asking him to be his Secretary of Agriculture. And he came into that position in 1933 when farm prices were at an all-time low, when land, when soil had eroded from places that should never have been plowed. So there were many, many problems that he had to deal with. So as U.S. Secretary of Agriculture, he is known for the Agricultural Adjustment Act, which was the first time that farmers were asked not to produce. They, were, they kept producing and kept producing, and um, so prices were going down, down. So they needed to um, do things in the marketplace that would have, there would be a need then for the product. At first, people couldn't believe the things that he was proposing regarding that, but then as prices went up, they started to listen to him. And people still refer to him today as the genius Secretary of Agriculture. He led farmers through that horrible time when some of them didn't know where to turn next. They didn't have any money. Their farms were being lost and um, prices because of pricing being so low. So he was a hero as U.S. Secretary of Agriculture. In 1940, President Roosevelt asked Henry A. Wallace to be his vice president. And um, so Henry A. Wallace agreed. At that time, 
in convention, they had to vote on who was going to be the presidential candidate and who was going to be the vice presidential candidate. So um, he was on the ticket in 1940 and they won as a team. And in 1941, he took the oath of office as US vice president. Henry A. Wallace had four years as a vice president. And during that time, he did more than any other vice president had done up until that time. He served as President Roosevelt's liaison to the Manhattan Project. And that was the development of nuclear energy for weaponry. And at first, he was intrigued by the whole notion of nuclear energy. But when he saw what was being developed, he, he stood up and he said, no, this, this cannot be used for against other human beings. So when he made points such as that, and he wasn't afraid to make those type of statements and to talk about it, he began to be questioned by other people and he wasn't, became less popular through the years. Another thing relating to the war that Henry A. Wallace did was as the war was winding down, he became vocal that the United States should not get into an adversarial position with the Soviet Union. And because people were, you know, there were already people talking about that Russia was going to be the next entity that the United States needed to be fearful of. And because of that, that was a downfall for Henry A. Wallace. And we know what happened after that. The United States did get into a long Cold War with the Soviet Union. So things probably would have been a lot different if people would have listened to him, but um, that was the demise of his political career concerning the vice presidency of the United States. Some of the things that he was saying publicly got the attention of the Progressive Party, and they came to him and asked if he would be their presidential candidate for the 1948 election, and he agreed to do that because being out of Washington, D.C., he felt he was freer to say things that he felt was, were important to the country. So he was, um, he was not afraid to go into the South. In fact, he was the first presidential candidate to do this, to go into the South and oppose the Jim Crow laws. And he talked about equal pay for equal work. He um, talked about that it was right to have the lunch program in the schools. So he talked about things that were way ahead of the thinking of the um, majority of the people in the United States. And he did not get very many votes in the 1948 election. He lived out the last years of his life in the state of New York and he uh, acquired Lou Gehrig's disease. And, um, and this is just a testament to the scientist he was his whole life. When he um, found out the diagnosis, he called the Center for Disease Control and said, you can use me to figure out this horrible disease. You can take tissue samples, you can do whatever you need to do. And that was the scientist in him. And he lived um, about less than two years after the diagnosis and a few months before he died when he could still um, speak. He was asked by a reporter, what do you think is the greatest thing, problem facing the United States? And he said, um, people moving away from the land. And because it's happening, Soon there will be problems with the economy, with the environment, and um, with communities.